In 1945, after a four-year stint in the Navy, Hubbard became involved in ritual magic with a protege of British Satanist Alistair Crowley. They start performing ceremonies to find a woman who will be willing to be the mother of an incarnation of the Antichrist, Babylon. Sexual ceremonies were performed between Parsons and Cameron with Hubbard watching and telling them what to do and observing things on the astral plane. And this was meant to, you know, she would become pregnant and they would control this elemental destructive force. I can't emphasize this too much. Hubbard was trying to incarnate pure evil so that he could control it to his own ends. But the church insists that Hubbard's participation in the alleged rituals was part of a government mission. We know about L. Ron Hubbard. He was sent in by one of the American security forces uh, with the brief to shut the thing down, which effectively he did. Government agent or not, Hubbard was destined to become the pop therapist of his era. In 1950, at the age of 39, he wrote an essay in astounding science fiction, detailing discoveries he made about the human mind in a science he called Dianetics. The essay became the foundation for Dianetics, the modern science of mental health. Dianetics through mind. And this book, that, that, that's the background of all of this. That's what started all the trouble. Little boxes on the hillside, little boxes. The world into which Dianetics was released in May of 1950 was overall a world of conformity. You had soldiers returning to the United States and they were effectively told this. You get yourself a good job, you get yourself a tract home, and you live a conformed life. And if you're lucky, you will get yourself a swimming pool after, of course, you've dug your bomb shelter. You will have children, and they will in turn will have grandchildren, and then you will die and you will become nothing. All of a sudden, here comes Dianetics. And Dianetics is saying, wait a minute, what if you can really rise above the state of a human being into something more special, into what ultimately became a clear? Hubbard claimed to have uncovered the cure of virtually every ailment known to man, and professed to have healed himself from partial blindness caused by an alleged war injury. Hubbard promised his book could work wonders on anyone who tried it. He said that, that he could take anybody who was not brain damaged and in less than a thousand hours of therapy, which could be done by somebody completely untrained other than having read the book, you could take this person to a state called clear. Hubbard claimed that all illnesses were psychosomatic and could be cured by eliminating painful past experiences from the brain. The brain is a sort of a switchboard. And engrams is mental image pictures that consist of pain. Whether it's mental or physical pain, it's there. We have two minds. We have the uh, analytical mind that doesn't make mistakes at all. We have the reactive mind. That's the culprit. Hubbard said the troubling reactive mind could be forever discarded through auditing. During an auditing session, one confesses his innermost thoughts to another, all the while monitored by an electrometer, a tool similar to a lie detector. Auditing, said Hubbard, allowed one to relieve his mind from troubling past life traumas. Hubbard was eager to share Dianetics with prominent mental health experts. He said, here, you take it, use it, help people with it. They rejected it. They were afraid of it. But the book was an instant bestseller. And we expected this to sell about 6,000 copies, and, uh, and this textbook was published. And it hit the top of the bestseller list of the New York Times, and it just stayed there month in, month out. Hubbard's open contempt for the field of psychiatry and the popular theories of Sigmund Freud also caused a ripple. Is this a form of psychoanalysis? No, psychoanalysis, they lay back. Don't, don't associate Scientology with such people. That, that's terrible. That, that's bad manners, you know? I mean, that, that uh, business about sex and all that sort of thing. That's for the neurotic or the person who is insane or something like that. That has nothing to do with Scientology. The psychiatric institutions and, and prominent psychiatrists kept attacking Dianetics it became clear that what they were engaged in had nothing to do with helping anybody. It had nothing to do with making someone more capable of making someone happier. Electroshock therapy may be recommended for other disorders. It only had to do 
with keeping them quiet, giving them drugs, performing electric shock treatments on them. Hydrotherapy is useful in calming disturbed patients. Those sort of things are barbarities. And I think that Mr. Hubbard was one of the first people that stood up and said, wait a minute, this is wrong, something needs to be done about it. We're going to take responsibility for making sure that people are not being turned into vegetables at the hands of psychiatry. Glowing testimonies to Hubbard's technology led to the creation of the Hubbard Association of Scientologists. Based in Hollywood, the organization taught Hubbard's courses to those willing to pay the $25 an hour for the therapy. The Food and Drug Administration was suspicious. The FDA, which believed Hubbard was making medical claims for the E-meter, paid a visit to the D.C. organization in 1963. They hired a bunch of longshoremen, sent them into the church in Washington, and cleaned the place out. They took the books, they took the E-meters, they took the vitamins, they took everything out. Hubbard, furious was convinced that psychiatry professionals had tainted the U.S. government against him. When L. Ron Hubbard started Scientology and created Scientology in the 50s, he did it at the height of McCarthyism. And he came across with new ideas and a whole new way of looking at things and a new perspective. And J. Edgar Hoover at the time wasn't exactly fond of new ideas. And uh, the whole approach of the United States government was to be suspicious of, of new leaders were coming at the time. Martin Luther King was a, a great target of the FBI. L. Ron Hubbard was a target of the FBI. While Hubbard distrusted the government, he viewed psychiatry, a profession that also treated the human mind, as the number one enemy of Scientology. It was uh, part of the sort of lore that you learned when you went into the organization. Scientology has enemies. Some of them you will need to deal with very firmly. The enemy to Scientology is anybody that questions Scientology, anybody that opposes it, anybody that challenges it, anybody that in the Scientology language is counter-intentional. It was Hubbard's belief in the existence of a global conspiracy against Scientology that would define him and his church. The Aaron said that you have to fight back against your oppressor. If you don't, he will gain strength and more strength and more strength and wipe you out. When we return, L. Ron Hubbard feels the heat of the IRS and takes to the sea. The United States of the early 60s saw a new generation of Americans, suspicious of traditional authority. The atmosphere was ripe for L. Ron Hubbard, a sci-fi writer gone spiritual leader, to spread his promises of do-it-yourself healing to the people. We live in a world where, 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 uh, where we have governments and we have societies and so forth who are desperately trying to help man. They are trying, however, to solve his problems for him. By 1960, Hubbard had taken Dianetics one step further and founded the Church of Scientology. A cross appeared on Hubbard's buildings. His writings became scriptures and his students parishioners. It was an alternative therapy, an all, uh, a non-recognized alternative mental therapy. But Hubbard actually made us start wearing ministers uniforms and put up the trappings of religion around so that the IRS would get off his case. But Hubbard contended that since his work dealt with man as spirit separate from his body, he had entered the realm of religion. We have a 2,000 year history of man uh, as a spirit, whereas we only have less than a century of considering simply mud. And uh, therefore, uh, I my study is more traditional than uh, most philosophies. Hubbard and his upstart religion provoked contempt. Hubbard had been kicking over rocks and exposing things, and the government didn't like him, and the communists didn't like him, and, the, and Nixon didn't like him, and, and he had all these big enemies. The church outlined these enemies in its publication, Freedom Magazine. Freedom proudly published exposés on bizarre psychiatric practices, including what it called psychiatric work camps in South Africa and a strange deep sleep therapy in England. He talked about the secret 
program that was being conducted by the intelligence community using psychiatrists called MK Ultra that we finally found out about it but it was using drugs and hypnosis in, tr in order to create an, in essence a Manchurian candidate while Hubbard went after the government the government went after him in 1967 the IRS revoked the Church of Scientology's tax exemption stating that Scientology was a commercial not religious organization Hubbard lived in luxury and was suspected of skimming huge sums of money from the church. He immediately became the subject of an IRS probe into his financial dealings. Outraged, Hubbard began penning a number of policy letters on how to deal with Scientology's enemies. The fair game policy refers to utterly destroying any critics. That a Scientologist can do whatever is required to destroy a critic. And the fair game policy is one of the policy letters in that series of documents that also include how to conduct a noisy investigation, black propaganda. In the Manual of Justice, he writes, uh, the purpose of the lawsuit is not to harass, but to destroy. Attorney Ford Green, a former follower of Sun Young Moon, says Scientology's policies did not come as a surprise. All cults draw a dichotomy between those on the inside and those on the outside, where those on the outside are lesser people and are treated by a whole different system of morality that can justify uh, misconduct from cheating, lying, to killing. Scientology calls it fair game. Uh, the Unification Church can call it heavenly deception. It became misinterpreted. And what it said was that if someone has left the Church of Scientology, or if someone is directly attacking the Church of Scientology, that person no longer has recourse to the internal ethics and justice procedures within the church. It was canceled, but for PR reasons, because it had been being misinterpreted. But ex-members claim that the militaristic policies remained. You have to understand that, that the mentality of the organization is that it's a, first of all, it's built on a military model. It's not a religious model. He's got policy letters that are called battle tactics, right? And there are battle plans. Hubbard's battle plan was executed by the Guardian's office, set up in 1966 to deal with Scientology foes. Hubbard, who had officially resigned as formal head of the church in 1966, put his wife, Mary Sue, in charge. But ex-members say Hubbard was still in charge. They were Aaron Hubbard's intelligence agency. That was their purpose, and indeed an intelligence specialist in the U.S. has said that they were as effective as the CIA. In 1973, the Guardian's office implemented a program known as Operation Snow White. The group began to use the Freedom of Information Act to access government files, and it proved federal agencies were circulating lies about the church. He dreamed up a conspiracy to explain all this problem, and he created a, a top-secret program called Snow White to uncover and find the source of this conspiracy. But Scientology did indeed uncover some bizarre documents in government files. At one point there was a document that said, aha, we have discovered Timothy Leary has, knows a man called Alfred Hubbard. Alfred Hubbard obviously is L. Ron Hubbard. Therefore, perhaps L. Ron Hubbard is really Timothy Leary and that there is money from LSD being channeled into the Church of Scientology. I mean, this is how absurd these reports were. There was this constant barrage of assaults coming from these government agencies. So the Guardian's office was set up in order to deal with those external facing matters of the church. The target of media scrutiny and under investigation by tax authorities, Scientology's founder evaded growing hostility against him by purchasing a yacht and taking to sea. He went off to begin a project of further research. He took with him a few very dedicated members of the religion, which became the nucleus of what we now know today as the Sea Organization. The most dedicated members of the religion are members of the Sea Organization. They dedicate their entire lives to accomplishing the goals and objectives of Scientology. It's the people who sign a billion year contract come back lifetime after lifetime serving Hubbard. On the ship, Hubbard enhanced his bridge to total freedom, creating new levels above that of clear. 
Hubbard acquired more ships to accommodate the sea organization. The secrecy surrounding Hubbard's mini flotilla did not help Scientology's reputation abroad. Not only had to leave the United States, he finally had to leave the United Kingdom, and then he was kicked out of Greece. He couldn't even land his ship after a while. The animosity culminated in Portugal in 1975. A whole bunch of people were in the streets, and someone got them all hyped up, and they filled up a bunch of taxis with rocks, and they went down to the Apollo, and they started stoning the ship. It was a time of incredible upheaval and upset and people in the streets, and this rumor went around. It went like wildfire. Pretty soon you're seeing on, on walls in the harbors, Apollo equals CIA, Apollo equals CIA. Frankly, we all thought it was pretty amusing. Like, the last people in the world to be accused of, the CIA, of being the CIA is the Church of Scientology. We had been in a pitched battle with the CIA since 1950. After the incident, Hubbard returned to land, determined to uncover the source of the hostility against Scientology. What do you do when you're under assault? What do you do when you're being attacked by the biggest governments in the world? And this is not paranoia. How do you respond? How do you deal with it? Yes, there were, there were a number of directives that were written. Ultimately, when you're in a battle with the United States government, for an example, if it's simply a war of attrition, there's no doubt who's going to win a war of attrition. And the war was just beginning. When investigative reports returns, the Church of Scientology does battle with the FBI and an author who dares to attack their motives. On July 7, 1977, 134 FBI agents stormed into Scientology centers in Washington and Los Angeles. We hit the front page of every newspaper in the country at that time. At an official press conference, the church claimed that its stance against the obscure Alaskan mental health bill had made it a target of the White House. We put out a publication, and uh, Richard Nixon, who was vice president at that time, was in favor of this bill. And we attacked the bill and said that it's, uh, it's totally oppressive. And within two days, the Secret Service burst into our church and <coughs> threatened us never to use Nixon's name again, and that they were sent here on express orders of Richard Nixon. So we're not a quiet group. It was revealed that the Church of Scientology was one of the top targets of uh, the Nixon White House and was on the infamous Nixon enemies list, the White House list. But the raids revealed that Operation Snow White had gone too far. Members of the Guardian's office, in an attempt to prove a conspiracy against the church, had been robbing government files and infiltrating federal agencies. They started burglarizing government files, burglarizing media files, burglarizing psychi psychiatrist files. And uh, one of the intelligence boys walked off and told the story to the Department of Justice which had began to piece some things together. Several top Scientologists were arrested. Hubbard's wife, Mary Sue, was among those jailed for the crimes. Suddenly, this was no longer just a little thing on the side that some people were doing, like meditation and uh, chanting. This was something that was taking on the federal government, taking on the media, taking on professionals, taking on judges. And that's when Hubbard became the focus. But Hubbard had vanished. After, after the raid of 77, uh, Hubbard went into serious hiding. He was at one point hiding at a place between Los Angeles and Palm Springs out there in the edge of the desert. Back in Los Angeles, church officials were dealing with a public relations nightmare. With the raid of 77, they got all of our files. They got our secret packs. They got the stuff that we studied. They began to get the directives regarding how this is all done. So suddenly, the magic act was gone. Most damaging were files showing that the church waged war on its critics by dead agenting them. And now dead agenting somebody means making them not be credible anymore by reason of showing the world the dirt, the real dirt on them. He wrote uh, at one point, uh, investigate those who attack us, make it as rough as possible, spread lurid lies. One example of this policy captured the media's attention. The FBI discovered Scientology's documents explaining what they were doing to Paulette Cooper uh, and how they were doing it. In 1971, 
Cooper had written The Scandal of Scientology. She was the first person who ever wrote a book critical of Scientology and in furtherance of their opportunistic policy of retribution called Fair Game uh, set her up. Operation Freakout was used to intimidate Cooper. An anonymous letter was sent to all the tenants of the apartment block she was in, I think it was something like 200 people, saying that she was a child molester. They also hired a private investigator to go to her door and put a gun to her head, uh, unloaded, but pulled the trigger. The, the final trick was they somebody somehow got her fingerprints on a piece of paper and they then wrote a bomb threat on this piece of paper and sent it to an Israeli embassy. So the FBI were around there and arrested her. Paulette Cooper was driven very, very close to the brink of, of a total nervous breakdown by what happened to her. Really was a pretty stupid thing to do. But they stepped outside the law. They were thrown out of the church. Paulette Cooper refused to be interviewed for this program, citing fears of harassment by Scientology. The church claimed Hubbard knew nothing of Operation Freakout and promised it was restructuring the church. There was a reorganization that took place in order to structure the church so that nothing like that could ever happen again. What happened in 1982 was that the Church of Scientology expelled something like 600 members. And we were told, as you'll probably remember, that we weren't allowed to talk to these people. The bad press had damaged the church, which many began to describe as a cult. The 80s found the anti-cult movement flourishing. The shocking images of Jim Jones and hundreds of his followers dead from cyanide-laced Kool-Aid, still fresh in the American psyche. The sensational treatment of the incident alarmed Scientology. Jim Jones and his activity was really a fairly mainstream Christian church. They weren't some weird gang that was, uh, you know, just being invented by a, a Johnny-come-lately. They were, they were Christian. Now, what happened to them? I don't know. But I know what happened in the world as a result of what happened in Jonestown, which was you had the new N-word, the C-word, Jonestown cult cult bad cult Scientology the word cult can be used and you can imply there's a huge threat you can imply that suddenly this organization has got its tentacles everywhere was the Church of Scientology a cult or a religion in 1982 the city of Clearwater called official hearings on the matter the church was accused of plotting to take over the city ex-members came forward to recount their horror stories about the church. At the hearings, former Sea Organization Captain Scott Mayer spoke about life on the ship with Hubbard. We all heard him from time to time screaming and yelling uh, on the ship at somebody who had an incredibly fierce temper. Anybody at any time could be put down in the bilges, or put up on the rails and tossed overboard. I mean, somebody would fish him out but it was mostly the humiliation factor of being, you know, like the old walking the plank. Supposed illegal activities on board the ships were also revealed. Telex transmissions were used to set up uh, fun smuggling, and he had a couple million dollars in the strong box right on Apollo. The notion that Scientology was a dangerous cult was furthered by bizarre tales about the Rehabilitation Project Force, a discipline program where C organization members perform hard labor. You can make any religion sound really dumb. Suppose if you said there's a cult in which the members of this cult, the Christian cult, and they go around and they eat a biscuit which they say is the body of their God. And they drink wine which they say is the blood of their God. And this is a ritual. You could make this sound absurd. What's happened with Scientology is that it's become like the representative demon cult. But was Scientology a sect that endangered its own devotees or an unjustly demonized emerging religion? The policies of the church were now coming under increasing scrutiny. And the critics want some definitive answers from its founder, L. Ron Hubbard. But where was he?
The 80s saw a series of lawsuits brought against the Church of Scientology. Ex-members united, claiming they had been lied to and built out of millions of dollars. In 1985, an ex-Scientologist was awarded $39 million after she claimed the Church had falsely promised to improve her eyesight. Thousands of Scientologists converged on Portland to protest the verdict. I just don't see why something that has such a good intention is being so so persecuted. I mean, in my 10 years, I've never had to come out to this degree. Church members were fervent. I'm going to call my boss Monday morning and tell him that my religion is being attacked. Yes, Scientology works, and we want everybody in, on the planet to know that. The verdict was eventually overturned. That was a big changing point in our group, and um, Portland was uh, pivotal. The case raised questions about the prices the church charges for its courses. There are people who spent millions of dollars who didn't have millions of dollars. There, you know, there are people who left Scientology 10 years ago who are still paying back the money they borrowed to do it. There is a range of services that the church offers and provides which go from free to costing some money depending on how one is stationed and what one wishes to do. The books are charged for more or less normal rate that books are charged for. For the courses and uh, auditing services, donations are requested. I don't have a problem with that. They need to survive. Everybody needs to survive. Plus, you put a value on something. That, that's just never been an issue for me. If people didn't want it, if it wasn't, setting, if it wasn't helping them lead better lives, they wouldn't, do, they wouldn't pay for it. Scientology was proving persistent in its battles. In the 80s, the church continued its fight with the IRS. We co-founded the National Coalition of IRS Whistleblowers, and this gave a forum to these former IRS agents and also people who worked in other areas of government who knew about IRS crimes or dirty tricks. And throughout all of this, not a word from L. Ron Hubbard. In fact, in 1982, Hubbard's estranged son claimed his father was dead. When's the last time you saw him? September 1959. Everybody else haven't seen him since uh, March 1980. There's got to be more to it than that. You're taking this to court. What? Well, I think we have enough evidence to show that he is probably dead. Uh, but of course, we don't have his body. The church moved fast to defuse the rumor. The Church of Scientology today produced what it called evidence to quell rumors that its founder, L. Ron Hubbard, is dead. I have here my own personal copy with the two colored <coughs> spots of ink and with Mr. Hubbard's personal fingerprint over the ink scientifically proving <clears throat> that Mr. Hubbard had to be signing this document and putting together after February 2nd 1983. Church officials also produced greetings from Hubbard inexorable promptitude 1983 is upon us is that ron hubbard you bet your life the church said hubbard was not hiding nor dodging subpoenas but writing and directing internal technical films there would be six messengers on duty when he was filming one would hold his chair one would hold a packet of cigarettes and as soon as she saw that the cigarette he had was going out would have to light another and give it to him one held the ashtray one held his pen, and so on. There were six of them round him. One of them was put on the humiliating rehabilitation project force, where she probably served for several months because she didn't get a chair there fast enough. Conflicting reports began to emerge about how Hubbard was spending his final years. He suddenly found himself with a little spare time on his hand, so he turned to the world of fiction. What came out of that was Battlefield Earth and the ten-volume Mission Earth series. The last time I saw him, he was shaking, virtually uncontrollable. Uh, he was kind of dithering around trying to explain something about the sunlight. On January 27, 1986, the news broke. L. Ron Hubbard was dead. The announcement provoked wild media speculation. The people who were more or less having difficulty with Scientology were trying to prove that he was dead when he was alive. When he died, they were trying to prove he was alive. <laughs> so, you know, this is the media. 
Some cried that with Hubbard unable to cancel policies and make new proclamations, Scientology would be unable to change with the times. According to Scientology's definitions, scripture is what was written and spoken by L. Ron Hubbard. It can't change. Scientology's policies and practices are written in stone. We will not allow it to become aberrated. We will not change it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. To Scientologists who believe in reincarnation, the news was hopeful. The last thing that was really wanted was for Hubbard to be sort of dead, like a mortal man. So something had to be dreamed up. And so what was dreamed up was that he had moved on to a new level of research. Despite the ridicule by outsiders, Scientologists were certain. Hubbard had merely discarded his body to move on to the next level of research. Hubbard had achieved his goal, to operate at a state outside the body. A being is a being. He is a spirit. And he actually can exist independent of his body. This is one of the more interesting discoveries in Scientology. The charismatic leader of the Church of Scientology had passed on. Could Scientology outlive its founder? Scientology lost its founder in 1986, and the news that Hubbard was no longer sparked a flurry of unofficial biographies. I knew that there was some question mark over L. Ron Hubbard's background. The church presents um, a picture of L. Ron Hubbard as being a very extraordinary individual and um, was almost prepared, rather in the manner of Jesus Christ, to become this extraordinary guru. We have with us Russell Miller, the author of The Barefaced Messiah. Now, the church says that he was born into a distinguished naval family. It's a lie. The church says that he was an explorer. It's a lie. The church says that um, he was a war hero. It's a lie. He was a bigamist. He was a child abductor. And in the later stages of his life, he descended into uh, the classic symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia. <laughs> Isn't this totally to discredit the, 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 the history as published of the life of Ron Hubbard and therefore to discredit the church totally. I know for a fact that the people in this book, and I've read it, are all people who are not active Scientologists. How on earth can you give a balanced picture? Practicing Scientologists were mystified by the attacks on their hero. Did Thomas Jefferson have affairs or did he not have affairs? Does that change the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution? The question is what is the work, what is the legacy? And I believe that what Hubbard said about life and living this is helpful and can improve the conditions of life. I don't care, much care, whether it was a man, woman, black, white, Asian, Hispanic. I really don't care. And I mean that. I actually don't care. Miller claimed he was a victim of fair game for his tough portrayal of Hubbard. I had a call from the police um, saying that I'd been identified as a suspect in the murder of a private detective in South London, a man who'd been stabbed. I said, I, th I think I know what's going on, and I explained to them that I suspected the Church of Scientology or an a, a over-enthusiastic Scientologist had fingered me for this crime. The Church sought injunctions to stop the book, which was never published in America. A number of lawyers commented that life was too short to litigate against the Church of Scientology because of what the Church puts lawyers through who go up against it. They have told me on several occasions, we make life rough for people who sue us. The media ignored those warnings and began covering Scientology with a vengeance. In April 1991, Time magazine published Cult of Greed, a scathing cover story on the Church of Scientology. The Time magazine article charged that the Church of Scientology wasn't a religion, but rather an organization obsessed with making money. The relentless article called Hubbard a lying flim-flam man, accused the church of mind control, and contended that the church's parent organization was squirreling away over $400 million in offshore bank accounts. Scientology fought back by slapping time with a $416 million libel suit. After our cover story, uh, the church launched a multi-million dollar ad campaign uh, smearing me and smearing Time Magazine. The church accused Time Magazine of being at the hands of Eli Lilly, makers of Prozac, 
and a Scientology foe. That article was the product of a campaign that was being waged to discredit the church for exposing the dangers of Prozac. And Eli Lilly and company purchased 750,000 copies of that magazine before it went to print. They have depressed the share value of Eli Lilly, which probably concerns Eli Lilly. And I believe it's part of Hubbard's vendetta against psychiatry. Eli Lilly refused to comment on the Church of Scientology. After spending $10 million in legal fees, time won the suit defamation lawsuits can really serve as a deterrent to people who engage in provocative or controversial or offensive expression. What the Supreme Court has called this kind of effect is a chilling effect. So is the job of the press to just look at somebody's mask and say, oh, well, of course, that's what you are? Or is the job of the press to dig behind and see really what the substance is and to really see what's going on? Journalists who have covered Scientology have long held that they are harassed and investigated. I believe that Scientology tries to make uh, reporting about Scientology a traumatic experience in the hopes that it will prevent reporters or deter reporters from writing about them. And of course you never go into an interview without doing a background check on the reporter. So you run that reporter through the voting records, through the bankruptcy records, through court records. You interview his friends, you see what else they've done, so you get a feel of this, whether or not this is an enemy reporter. Well, of course, Scientology, for journalists, has become like a target of opportunity. It's like you can portray it as this demonic organization, you can uh, portray it as greedy, as relentless, as a dangerous foe, which, of course, gives the impression that you're very courageous to be going after it. German reporter Mona Boutros recently experienced Scientology's tough policy on unfriendly journalists. Three persons with you, he has been physically threatened by the Church of Scientology and they are the ones following us. They're stalking us. Our main objective in the dark side of Scientology was to inform the public about criminal activities of the Church. Once we began shooting, the angle changed once the Church uh, found out about our project. Once they observed us gathering information and filming, they uh, didn't leave us alone after that. They followed us and they put pressure tactics and prevented us from working independently as journalists. Uh, the BMW is, yes, three cars and we would like to come to a, the closest police station. You got to say it's stalking because that's the fe felony. The only time that we have done anything to investigate a journalist who was doing an investigation into Scientology was when they wouldn't come to us, when they wouldn't ask us, what is it, what's the truth about this, when they wouldn't accept any of the information that we gave them, when they were clearly operating on some other agenda. Now, when someone like that shows up and they feel like they have the right to be digging around and investigating and finding out all the dirt and stuff that they can dig up to put in a story about us, I see nothing wrong with going and investigating what is it that's motivating them. Who said that a journalist is immune from someone looking into their methods and activities? Despite the possible headaches of covering Scientology, an interest in getting the inside story persists leading to undercover investigations by reporters who delight in provoking the church. I'm, I'm not going to lie and say I had a completely open mind. I mean, I thought, you know, because I noticed the scam working, you know, as soon as I walked in the door, them making a play for my credit card. I'm an introductory to Dianetics graduate. I got my hands around those cans of that e-meter, and baby, my needle floated. It floated good. The church says the cynicism comes from a media in search of the sensational. The media's interest in uh, three-headed babies and people that have been impregnated by outer space UFO aliens. Because I think it's very easy for the media, particularly people that are doing a short program or writing a short story, they've suddenly got to bang out in a couple of hours, to take and try and reduce things to sound bites. And because Scientology doesn't reduce to a soundbite, it just doesn't lend itself to media coverage. It doesn't lend itself to some kind of accurate treatment. We're not just uh, blank. 
Scientology often expresses frustration with the press and has taken to conducting its own investigations, publishing them in Scientology magazines. From our perspective, the more you know, the less likely you are to be victimized, the less likely you are to become uh, a target, to actually be safe. In 1991, the church utilized national newspapers to air their gripes with the IRS. We figured, you know, huh, we're not going to get the IRS any more upset with us than they already are. So we published a series of ads in USA Today, and they documented the fact that the IRS was, in fact, abusing all sorts of people. I mean, you know, the, when, when the Scientology, like, goes after an institution, they don't just pick on little guys, <laughs> as people might. I mean, they pick on the IRS, because they were obviously wanted tax-exempt status. They thought they deserved it. Scientology continues to utilize media channels to make its opinions known, but the organization is still notorious for pestering critics. When this program goes out, I can assure you, assure the producer of this program and the network that they will get exactly the same a happy ending that has happened. Absolutely, it's a promise, I guarantee it. The Church of Scientology recently launched a multi-million dollar public relations blitz. Church leadership says it's aimed at increasing membership and promoting its unique programs. Critics say it's merely an attempt to counter the growing negative publicity surrounding the church. In our next hour, we hear from current and former Scientologists as they speak out passionately about the church and its members. Also, a rare interview with a man who is now the group's spiritual leader as he prepares his flock for the 21st century. I'm Bill Curtis. Stay tuned. Since its emergence in the 1950s, the Church of Scientology has been a source of great fascination. It has spent many of those years at war with the U.S. government, the press, and portions of the public. But behind the headlines are real people who have experienced Scientology firsthand. In this second hour of a special A&E presentation of investigative reports, we heard directly from those who remain members of the church and from those who have now left it. As you will see, their stories vary dramatically. Remember, whatever you do, you do it to yourself. Well, it was a, it was a period in my life when I uh, was having uh, all kinds of different uh, marital and uh, adjustment problems. I went to visit a friend of mine, and he had changed remarkably since I had seen him the last time, and he was raving about Scientology and pointing at this chart on the wall of how you can, at this point, you have this ability, and up here you have the ability to, you know, exteriorize, and it's this whole progression thing that kind of interested me. Well, actually, I had a boyfriend who was a Scientologist, and he brought me down to Celebrity Center, and I had a tour, and I looked around, and I said, oh, this is nice, you know, and I signed up, and I did a basic course. I went through nine years of Scientology as a client of the organization. I paid them a lot of money, and they, in turn, gave me something back. I remember there was a time when I couldn't look at people. I couldn't look people in the eye. I was very sort of withdrawn and, you know, and you sort of get the skill and you, and you drill it and you become better and better at it. And you were taught uh, to sit and have eye contact with another individual for hours on end. I'm talking not move, not blink, not twitch, not sweat, not anything for two hours at a stretch and that's to pass one of these drills. When I have received the Scientology or Dianetics auditing, I experience a similar thing, a freedom, and a getting back in touch with myself and my actual views and opinions with which I can go back into life and do better. I felt great and I got rid of some stuff that I didn't realize that I was dragging around. And I said, whoa, I think I'll become a Scientologist. You get a lot of things out of Scientology that are workable up to a certain point. And that's when he sets the hook. And you find yourself on a series of upper level OT levels wherein you're not able to discuss your case with anybody else. You know, you're supposed to be acquiring superhuman powers. You're really not. It's emotional blackmail. The idea is that this is a whole spectrum of ability that goes all the way up to telekinesis. That you can move things, people, with your mind. But in the beginning, you have to just drag them. 
I hadn't seen my band in about three months, and we went to Zurich, Switzerland. And I came in, and they looked at me real weird. I said, man, something's, something's different about you. You look younger. Uh, this look in your eye. And of course, I was eager to tell somebody. If you had a problem, you came talk to me. I could, I could, what we call red you, uh, sign you up for something. I, and the Hubbard's techniques are, it doesn't matter, just tell them you can solve it. I was becoming increasingly worried about the high cost of Scientology. You know, we were up paying, you know, $200 per hour for counseling, which seemed excessive to me. You know, as professional therapists probably charge $50 to $100. What I would do is I would just say, what do I want to do next? You know, and I would say, well, I want to do that next. That sounds like something I would be interested in. And then I would just, you know, gradually and pay on it, and before you know it, you've got it paid. I became a Sea Org member, and from there on, I was 24-hour day Scientologist. I had no personal life. I, I lived in Scientology buildings. I was fed by Scientology. I was paid my $17.50 a week when I got paid at all. In 1979, I was, um, I was put in the rehabilitation project force because I made a joke about, about one of Hubbard's policies. RPF stands for Rehabilitation Project Force. It is a program that is exclusively for the benefit of C organization members. If they are stressed out, if they're not doing well on their job, if they're having problems, have them do menial type work and five hours a day of auditing and Scientology training. It's a fabulous program. I was locked in a chicken wire cage that was in the basement of the Fort Harrison Hotel where there's just huge boilers and dripping pipes, real gothic, you know, kind of <laughs> scene. They came banging on the door uh, one night, early morning at 4 a.m once and they took my wife. It really lets you know what it's like to live with the Gestapo when, when you can be so controlled and so afraid that they can just say your wife's leaving, grab, you're to grab a couple of things, you're coming with us and tell me to just go back to bed and I go back to bed. The stories I began to hear were incredible. My membership was relatively soft. I was never on the staff of Scientology. Nobody had told me that people were thrown off the ships into the water, put into the chain lockers. I didn't know. In nine years, that's how secretive Scientology is. And it's the mentality that it creates in members. If a monk that was in a Catholic order left the monastery, and he went out and he went to the media, and he said, you know, when I was in that monastery, I was not able to talk to anybody. I was never able to see my family. I had to sleep on a bed of straw or on concrete. I got woken up seven times a night to say prayers. Do you think that if someone went out with those sort of allegations to the media, that anybody would give them even the time of day? If you're connected with somebody who is uh, against Scientology principles, you're required to disconnect from them. If you want to continue in Scientology, you have to disconnect from them. Disconnect means exactly what it sounds like. You can have no contact with the person. They can't. You don't let them call you, you don't let them write, you don't answer their letters. They are out of your life. If you have someone who is antagonistic to you and your objectives in life, and you are unable to get that person to stop being antagonistic towards doing that, then you have two choices. You either stop doing what you're doing that they are complaining about, or you don't pay any attention to what they're saying anymore and you cut, cut off the line. I was required to disconnect from my brother and I nearly disconnected from my parents. You know people were living in misery they weren't getting what they were supposed to be getting which was spiritual enlightenment I never heard the, the word God used once in all of that time I never saw a church service all I ever did was see people worked into the ground to make money for Hubbard. And after a while, I just couldn't stomach it anymore. I had to leave. That's all you have to do in a cult, is say, uh-uh, I'm not going to go along with it. And they got no use for you anymore. So 15 years later, I was shown the door. They came after me, and I could hear the motorcycles, because they have the motorcycles. They start out, and they came looking for me. 
I went to a um, uh, home of somebody on the reservation. I just knocked on the door. I said, excuse me, but I, my car broke down over here. Do you mind if I just use your phone? I, I'll pay you. And I just had some money. I, I have to call. So I called my wife. And I called her, and I was crushed because she said they're here with me. Because by the time I got into the phone, they had gone out there, and they had grabbed a hold of her, and they had had her under guard. And I knew I, could, they, I was trapped. They let me call a cab, and I, and as I got out of the cab, there was one of the guards in one of the trucks behind me. He says, hi, Vaughn. And I said, just get away from me, and I made it into the motel. I knew they wouldn't try to physically drag me out. They don't do that. It's always coercion. They smiled. Everything's going to be fine. Come on back, et cetera. And so I was talked back in. That's, that's why I make this comparison to the drug addict and the alcoholic. You know, yo, yeah, we'll talk about your alcohol problem. Here, have a drink. Let's talk about it. I had, I had uh, two children. My oldest and my youngest children were living with me. The oldest had signed a Sea Org contract at, at age nine. I said, you, you know, we, do you want to stay or do you want to come with me? I'm leaving Scientology. She decided she wanted to stay, and it took her another year to get out of there, and she almost didn't. It gets inside people. It saturates people. Um, in a study of cults done by Conway and Siegelman in the U.S., they studied a thousand ex-cult members, and at the end, they said Scientology has the most debilitating set of rituals of any cult in America. They reckon that recovery time, unassisted, for somebody who left Scientology, would average twelve and a half years. It's like getting on a boat, pushing off from shore, and not even knowing what's out there, and not even knowing if there's an edge of the world you might fall off. But all you know is I would rather die on the open seas and die a free man than die inside that organization with what I've come to see is, is just complete totalitarian mind control. Yeah, I mean, I made it through Vietnam. I've made it through more. I should have been dead years ago. If I go now, I go now. You know? But if I can do something to keep some, someone else from getting hurt or someone else from being conned, someone else's life from being messed up by these creeps, I'm more than willing to do it. It's a small price to pay. That's the way I feel about it. Sometimes when you veer off the road to total freedom, uh, you can get back on. If you get off, you might get chewed up. If you stay on, you will get through it. You got to trust it. But if you freak out, oh, I don't, don't want to do this no more. I don't wanna... Things can happen. If one tenth of what these people say goes on in Scientology really did go on, there would be no Church of Scientology. This same small group of people, the ones that manage to get themselves into the media, the ones that go around, probably the ones that have contacted you and told you stories, those exact people are the people that have demanded tens, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars from the church to shut up. Now, if it really was true what they were saying, why would they be demanding money to stop? When Investigative Reports returns, the church in cyberspace... The 90s brought with it a new challenge for the Church of Scientology in the form of the Internet. The Internet has been a disaster for Scientology. Netizens, or people who spend a lot of time on the net, have a particular uh, Wild West attitude towards the First Amendment. They believe in freedom of speech, and any attempt to circumvent their freedom of speech uh, is resisted. Anti-Scientology websites have sprouted up, giving a louder voice to Scientology's dissident community. I'd just call the liars. I'd call them liars from every different angle. Ehrlich and others began denouncing Scientology and its founder. They were on the news group, making false representations, lying, and I just... <laughs> I just pointed it out in very graphic terms that they were lying. And when proof was required, I quoted to give them the proof. Ex-Scientologists also began disseminating the mysterious OT3, 
an advanced level in Scientology that is said to trace the source of man's pain to over 70 million years ago. I think it's really irresponsible. It happens to be confidential material. And people, when they get to that level, they read and see that material. And it's placed at that level for a reason. Whenever something goes wrong in terms of public relations, it's called, in Hubbard speak, it's called a PR flap. This is the granddaddy of PR flaps. The church wasted no time in getting their attorneys on the case. This is simply a matter of property rights being protected. It is not a freedom of the press issue. It is not a news gathering issue. It is not a freedom of speech issue. Everybody has documents and things they don't want to be seen. And, you know, which is proprietary information. Everybody wants that. Why do the Scientologists go after um, people who um, attack them? I think they do feel, and they've, they've acquired over the years, a, a siege mentality. And they've, they've been under a certain amount of siege. In 1995, the Church of Scientology, assisted by U.S. Marshals, raided the homes of three of its harshest detractors. Arnaldo Lerma caught the raid of his home on video. Church officials confiscated materials relating to Scientology on the grounds that the copywritten works were being exploited on the net. Is there a court order permitting you to be the substitute custodian for this search and seizure? If you want to see the court order, you can... They went through my, my house, cupboard by cupboard. They went through my computer, file by file. They copied whatever they wanted off of my computer. They copied my hard disk. They deleted whatever they wanted off my hard disk. They packed up books that belonged to me and to other people. Seven hours later, after going through and photographing everything in my house, looking in every you know, closet, cupboard, drawer, and they uh, packed up and left. Are you here with the Church of Scientology? No comment. No comment? What authority do you have to be taking these records? Do you think it's okay for him to steal property? Early can others claim their rights have been violated. So Scientology has ensured protection of its market share by suppressing speech. Because the more speech there is, the less successful Scientology is going to be. They are really their own worst enemy. They are the ones that make the critics. The, and then they force the critics to become enemies. And then these people become lifelong warriors. And they fulfill their own conspiracy theories by creating enemies, by their treatment of people. I believe that on the Internet, freedom of speech is a primary. And the more that we let fascistic, totalistic, groups like Scientology erode our rights, the less of this fantastic new medium, the less it's going to mean. The cry that these people give in justification is, the internet is an anarchy, we're anarchists, you can't stop us, so therefore, by trying to enforce the law, somehow that gets translated into, you're trying to stamp out free speech. I think it's curious the way the, the Church of Scientology uh, is attacked uh, for harassing its critics or for trying to silence its critics, but the Church of Scientology also has a right to freedom of speech. They want to make the record straight and say what their position is, and they have the same right to do that as their critics do. A religion has no more and no less right than anyone else to copyright material and to protect it from infringement. Uh, I think it's a kind of strange position for a religion to take, saying we have message that will save your soul and, and make you better, but uh, you, you may not read it unless you pay me. Such incidents got the attention of those outside the Scientology debate. I first became aware of the Church of Scientology when I read uh, an electronic uh, Freedom Foundation newsletter in January of 95, which indicated that the Church of Scientology had tried to uh, close an internet news group, which was a haven for critics of Scientology. Clinton quickly became involved in the anti-Scientology movement, spending almost $2 million to fund ex-members litigating against the Church. Scientologists are given uh, filtering software to allow them to go on the internet because they do not want Scientologists to be subjected to uh, critical information. You're dissuaded from contact 
with the outside world, reading papers, watching television, whatever it is. You might see something that is upsetting. If it's upsetting, you might need to get a session or go to ethics. Clinton has recently come under investigation by Scientology for his activities. He was attacked, and the more he was attacked, the more he got involved. He's a freak. He's a, a media freak. He is an animal of the media. He knows nothing about Scientology. <laughs> he doesn't have a clue. He's never been in a church of Scientology until I invited him in to sit down and talk to him to see if I could find out what his beef was. They have hate, basically, at the at the core of this cult, masquerading in the form of love. Scientology detractors hope that leaking secret materials on the web will discourage church membership. The Internet will be to Scientology what Vietnam was to the United States. It's going to be a battle that they can't win. The trade secrets that they're trying to protect, all that science fiction, space opera stuff at the end of the road, it's already on the hard, hard drives of millions of people. In other words, the cat's out of the bag. So anybody that cares to investigate this organization are just a few keystrokes away from finding the truth. And it's out there. While those opposed to Scientology are busy recounting their stories on the Internet, the church continues the intense effort to tell its story. When we return, a mission the Scientologists say will save the world. While church administration is busy dealing with a steady stream of conflict, individual Scientologists are out among the people, spreading Hubbard's word at every opportunity. Well, you know, the aims of Scientology are civilization without war, without criminals, without insanity, where the able can prosper, where honest beings have rights, and man is free to rise to greater heights. I get relief every time I hear those words, because that's the world I want you know for my son and for my family and for myself and for everybody you know it, it's a it's a it's an ideal scene at the heart of this missionary zeal is the Scientologists belief that his religion is the best perhaps only way to rescue a planet in danger life on planet earth is not a real happy place and yet we're all immortal spiritual beings if something is not done to improve the quality of life I think there will be more drugs, I think there will be more sad and upset and messed up people and more criminals and more inequities in the society. We've got to turn the situation around if life means anything to you. Scientology supported drug and literacy programs are multiplying around the country. I'd like people to know that the activities of the church are helping millions of people around the world every day. There are a lot of people who have found something that helps them and that that help is available to anybody who would like to have it. Scientology says the programs which use books written by Hubbard are secular. Skeptics call them recruitment fronts that hide their ties to the church. We can become a drug rehabilitation program. We've got nothing to do with religion. We become pious priests. You're threatening my freedom of religion. We can become educational programs. Oh, we're just here to help your son learn to read. We can become all those things, but really all it is is it's just one master plan to infiltrate all of these areas according to Hubbard's doctrine, and you become whatever it needs to become to protect it and infiltrate it and take it over. Narconon, a drug rehab program with ties to Scientology, has recently come under scrutiny. Scientology was collecting money from local school boards and also collecting money from uh, corporations and businesses and using that money to finance their lectures in the schools which promoted the purification rundown which is a religious practice in the Church of Scientology. It's not a religious program, it's not a religious organization, it's not run by the church, it's very supported by the church. Narconon recently set up shop inside the Enseñada State Prison, a Mexican penitentiary where inmates have easy access to heroin. The program, run by Joe Domingo, son of famed tenor Placido Domingo, utilizes Hubbard's drug technology to help prisoners kick drugs. Inmates help build saunas at the prison in order to utilize Narconon's purification rundown. I was a heroin addict and uh, I had a long-term heroin addiction and 
and a uh, problem with substance abuse and uh, went to jail three times, uh, tried other programs, uh, almost died basically, and uh, the Narconon program saved my life. Despite the church's involvement in these social programs, critics still say the motives are sinister. I don't know of any church anywhere who would want to get its base of members cr murderers and rapists and criminals I don't that doesn't make any sense and me right. being a Scientologist I have a very strong desire to help these people and to help the problem because there's such a problem but I, I don't know that I want to fill my church up with um, you know if you go out and voluntarily help a thousand people in the inner city to learn how to read there's some people in the world that have to find something wrong with that they have to figure out how there's something wrong so you know what they say ha huh, that's just all a trick it's all a front group it's all just to get these people into the church of scientology well you know what it isn't the church's learning programs have often been scrutinized by outsiders practicing scientologists swear by hubbard's technology I've used this study technology for 23 years. Uh, prior to that, I was, uh, I think I was your, your average guy as far as what one uh, knows uh, from what they learned in school. It gives you a kind of confidence and a, a braveness. Almost no subject matter seems unstudiable. I'm a jet pilot seven times over. I, uh, meaning I have seven separate licenses to, to fly just because I'm not afraid to ask the right questions to understand fully what I'm, uh, I'm studying. Isaac Hayes is the spokesperson for the World Literacy Crusade. If a building is on fire and my child is on the second or third floor, do you care? You think I care about who comes save my child? We're just simply talking about saving lives. And some people try to confuse the issues. Oh, don't take that stuff because they're going to try to make you become a Scientologist. No, 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 no. What if the people down there really got something out of what they learned in learning how to read and they wanted to find out more? They wanted to find out if there was something else that was written by L. Ron Hubbard that might help them. The Pope has an agenda to spread Catholicism to all the people that he can reach. I think Scientology, like any other religious group, believes that it has a mission to spread their truth as they perceive it. Your emotions, your personality, they're just chemical reactions. Man is nothing more than a brain. A brain! Forget the phony brain theories. Find out who you really are. It's the most popular and effective book on the human mind ever published. Scientology continues to exercise its freedom to spread Hubbard's message to the world. The church recently built a multi-million dollar facility on its desert compound to house Golden Era Productions, its film and video studios. There, hundreds of Sea Organization members live and produce every aspect of Scientology technical films. Dianetics and Scientology are, in fact, a very successful study of life itself. Members work round the clock shooting, processing, and scoring music for massive worldwide distribution. The films are purchased by Scientologists who want assistance with their coursework. The studio also mass produces e-meters, and translates Hubbard's lectures into over 50 languages. But as Scientology attempts to spread its message, there are those who work equally hard to stop it. The Cult Awareness Network, founded in 1974 as Citizens Freedom Foundation, their purpose was to educate the public about what they called at that time spiritual fraud. It was never meant to be an adversarial organization. We never intended... Uh, to put anyone out of business. 
Ken had for years criticized Scientology and provided so-called D programmers to parents desperate to bring their children out of cults. They did referrals, offered exit counseling, and in the old days, I guess they used to call it deprogramming. Of course, like psychiatry, Ken became a mortal enemy of Scientology. After several bloody lawsuits, the Cult Awareness Network went bankrupt, but Scientology did not stop there. In bankruptcy court, uh, a man presented himself, Stephen Hayes, who is a Scientologist and an attorney, and he offered to buy the name Cult Awareness Network, the telephone number, and the, the furnishings. Immediately, or almost immediately, Scientology began an organization called Cult Awareness Network. What they did with the Cult Awareness Network of finally becoming <laughs> your critic and now carrying your critic's name. I mean, you talk about body snatchers. Now you call up the Cult Awareness Network and guess what you're talking to? You have a Scientologist answering the phone there. And that's how they operate. It doesn't get any darker than that. Such aggressive moves point to Scientology's determination to spread its word at any cost. In another life, in the next life, do I want to come back to something that's charred and cinders because of a nuclear holocaust? Or do you think I'm going to come back to a world where crime and violence has, has been escalated enormously? No. So we need, if we want to save it, we need to work now. We're racing against the clock. Next. Why celebrities are so important to the Scientology movement. When we come back, how fame and stardom are used to promote a religion worldwide. The high-profile role of Scientology celebrities, which include America's most popular actor, Tom Cruise, adds to Scientology's mystique. I'm part of a of a frontier in a way, you know, that, that very few people ever get to be part of. Like a pioneer in many, in many ways. And I've, I've seen my efforts come to fruition. There's a famous letter written by L. Ron Hubbard saying, go out and get celebrities. Uh, that appears to be authentic and it seems, yeah, he's, Walt Disney and a number of other names were listed on it. The Hollywood Celebrity Center has long been a haven for entertainers who take specialized Scientology courses. Certificate of Special Congressional Recognition. So Celebrity Center is just like, you know, the stable datum of, like, growth and sanity and, and growing as an artist. And um, it's just like I'm always safe when I come here. It's the place to be. Like, everybody here is jamming, you know? Everybody's doing what they want to do. And if they're not, they're finding out why they're not, and they're getting to what they want to do. There are organizations on this planet where artists can go and find support and find the true measure of their creativity. Why do fame and Scientology intersect? They're spiritual freelancers. They're really out on the line with their emotions uh, as, their, as their medium. And it's an insecure profession for both practical reasons and emotional reasons. We're one of the, the few groups, let's say, that really cares about the survival of Hollywood in the way it should be. The, not only from the cleanliness of the streets of Hollywood, but to the, the kind of profile that uh, one imagines Hollywood could be or should be. Well, it's like, it's like a cult within a cult, you know? You have the cult of celebrity, and you have the cult of Scientology, and you've got a perfect match. What's sad, which, what, what's really sad about this is, is that when you know, the public at large sees John Travolta on national television, you know, you know, thanking L. Ron Hubbard at, at, at a Golden Globe Award ceremony or attributing his success to Scientology. And then they see that this guy's got planes, he's got, um, you know, sports cars, he's got it all. People automatically think, hey, maybe I can too. Those who uh, go against the status quo, and stand up for their beliefs, usually comes under scrutiny. And we as entertainers, I feel, and this is a personal belief here, I feel I have a responsibility as to how I live my life because people of note, they influence people.
Celebrity members are offended by the insinuation that they are pawns of the church. Uh, my fans respect me, and if I thought that I was giving them something that was detrimental to their survival, I wouldn't do it. I would not do it. Uh, and it would be remiss if I didn't share this. Celebrity parishioners recently came out in defense of the church, which is currently at odds with the German government. Right now in Germany, we've had over 19 human rights reports issued by some of the most prestigious organizations in the world condemning Germany's targeting of Scientologists. They're ostracized, they're alienated, they're disenfranchised. If you're identified as a Scientologist in Germany, you're going to be boycotted, blacklisted, your children will be kicked out of private school, your life will be ruined. Germany believes that it is at best a commercial organization. Uh, a political organization uh, bent upon creating a totalitarian st state and under their constitution uh, because of their recent history they are constitutionally prohibited from permitting totalitarian organizations to exist there Germany they're attacking the church they're violating uh, the very thing that they swore to uphold and that is to protect and respect religions the first time I heard about Germany and there was a problem with not only um, Scientology but other minority religions was uh, right around the Mission Impossible time where they were boy boycotting Tom's film and then shortly after there was an attempt to boycott one of mine and I guess the idea was if, if we were having trouble at a distance uh, then what about the people that actually were living there? Celebrity Scientologists took their concerns to Congress no one has died, no one has been put in camps. Uh, but if, if you observe that these facts are comparable to early 30s uh, treatment, then that's, you know, that's for you to observe. By standing up, you're doing the other religions a favor, actually. Because religious suppression is suppression no matter what it, where it comes from, or whenever it happens. Celebrity members recently appeared at the opening of L. Ron Hubbard Way, the street, found in the heart of Hollywood, is dedicated to the man to whom many stars attribute their success. I do simply live a better life, and a happier life, and a more um, successful life because of Mr. Hubbard. The enthusiastic words of glamorous Scientologists help the church into the mainstream. The one thing that was really cool about L. Ron Hubbard was that he really got the concept that if people united, um, and not in some airy-fairy way, but if they united and they put their, you know, muscle and brawn together and they worked really hard, you could create a better civilization. In October 1993, the church called thousands of parishioners together for an announcement by Scientology's top official, David Miscavige. On October the 1st, 1993, the IRS issued letters recognizing Scientology and every one of its organizations has fully tax-exempt the war! Many attribute the breakthrough with the IRS to David Miscavige. A lifelong Scientologist, Miscavige took the reins of the church at the age of 22. Miscavige, who has not granted a TV interview in seven years, sat down with investigative reports to discuss his church. All great religions have been attacked during their formative years. Uh, Scientology is no different. And the fact that we have emerged through this and come through uh, says a great deal about our tenacity and our ability to persevere. Scientologists are, if nothing else, the antimatter of quitters. There's an old saying, when the going gets tough, pit bulls call a Scientologist. Well, in any war, uh, there's casualties on both sides. Okay, we've overcome the obstacles, but certainly on our side, throughout that time period, we've made our mistakes. And in answer to that, all I can say is a testament to the validity of Scientology is that we've also uh, cleaned house, corrected our mistakes. You've just seen our religion emerge in the 20th century. Over its rocky 45-year history, Scientology has driven for mainstream acceptance. People have been searching for thousands of years for spiritual release and freedom. And what we have in Scientology is the answer, how to achieve that. 
ultimately the whole purpose is to help everybody else and that's all it is the church claims eight million members while outsiders say the number is around three hundred thousand regardless the Church of Scientology continues to expand, especially in Eastern Europe and Asia. Well, it's truly the, the religious philosophy that we need to get through at the turn of the century. L. Ron Hubbard continues to be revered by Scientology. The Church has purchased land in New Mexico and California to store the Hubbard Gospel. There, it will be protected from natural disasters or a nuclear holocaust. Whatever else man was trying to do, whether he was cultured or primitive and so on, he was attempting to survive. We're unique amongst other great religions of Earth in that all of our source materials or the original teachings of our religion have been recorded. Uh, so as a result, we expect that our religion will be taught and practiced the same way 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now. Scientology's startling battles with world governments and multi-million dollar companies represent more than a cheap play for money or power. By insisting that it has discovered the key to human happiness, Scientology has thrown itself into the ring with other religions in a fight for the hearts and minds of the people. What is the statement, God helps those who help themselves? Well, in Scientology we're engaged in helping people help themselves so they can fully comprehend and understand God. Freedom of religion means that every individual has the right to believe whatever it is that he or she wants and to engage in any kind of religious practice so long as that practice does not actually harm another human being or cause a great danger to society as a whole. In this country, the government is terrified of religion. They're terrified of taking a, a hard look in a hard stand and saying this kind of activity is religious this kind of activity is not when you have an organization that has a tax exemption and a staff that will say or do anything in order to get their point of view across i consider that to be an intrinsic threat to what i love about america the only ethics in the world are scientology ethics for the purpose of expanding scientology taking over the heads of government and ruling the world according to Scientology uh, technology. We're here, we're doing our thing, we're not trying to aggrandize or take over anybody at the same time we want to be left alone. Nobody's got to do it, nobody's forced to do it. I've never been forced to do it. It's always been my choice. Always been my choice. If somebody tampers with that choice, it's un-American. I don't think that Scientology should be banned, and I'm not seeking to stop Scientology from existing. I do want people to know the facts. I want them to know the truth about it so that they can make their own decision. The way to understand Scientology is to see it for yourself. We in Scientology don't tell you what you should conclude concerning any part of the religion. But when you've seen it in action, well, then you can make some conclusions. It's all about you. It's not about what anyone else says or thinks. It's about just an individual becoming a better stronger more powerful individual the only thing that I can see really occurring is that more and more people find out more and more about what Scientology is really about and uh, they'll sort of be ridiculed into history people don't want to accept new ideas a new and better way uh, to look at something they don't want to do that it's just a natural uh, a habit of man Reality is just agreement, nothing else. All this is held together only because we agree it's held together. And that's all Scientology is. It's a bunch of people saying and agreeing and chanting, this is the truth, this is the truth, this is the truth. And when you stop chanting it, there's nothing left. There ain't no truth. There ain't no truth. And <laughs> suddenly you find out that the only way you can be a Scientologist is to not be a Scientologist. You don't have to come into Scientology. You don't have to participate in it. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything you don't want to. But if you're looking for answers, there are a lot of answers in Scientology. The aim and goal of Scientology is to take an individual and put them in a position where they can confront their own problems and solve their own problems and so bring themselves up by their own bootstraps. Probably my favorite concept of, of L. Ron Hubbard's is uh, a world without criminality 
a world without war, and a world without insanity. And I know of no other group that uh, their goals are that clear. We want a clear planet. And what do I mean by clear? To totally eradicate the reactive mind. And that brings you to a state of clear. When you truly understand or have, have found the answers to life itself, and you truly understand the nature of the spirit, uh, what flows from that are all the answers. The advances in the sciences are monumental. They're mind-boggling. What about a similar advance in the field of spiritualism or religion? Why not? Scientology, we believe, is a point where science and religion are truly met. Scientology is for an able guy like you, or like me, uh, able to function in life, able to make his own way, does his work, and so forth. All right, that's the man that should be helped. With Hubbard's word as their guide, Scientologists fan across the globe, resolved to clear the planet for everyone. While the U.S. now views Scientology as a religion, that is not the case in other countries where the church has attempted to establish itself. Germany, as we briefly reported, is one. It has taken the official view that Scientology is not only not a religion, but an enterprise out to bilk its members of money. The German government has also said the Scientologists are a threat to democracy. The Scientologists have charged the Germans of using Nazi tactics and of practicing religious persecution. While some members of Congress have protested, the American government has taken no official action in the dispute. Join me tomorrow night as the members of New York's oldest motorcycle gang, the Chingalings, invite us into their violent and secretive gang, Road Warriors, the Biker Brotherhood on Inside Story. I'm Bill Curtis. Thanks for watching this special edition of Investigative Reports here on A&E. Now you can own a video cassette of this program. Call 1-800-423-1212 and you'll receive the program you've just seen for only $19.95 plus shipping and handling. Call 1-800-423-1212. Assault, sex, drugs, and drinking. A hell on wheels motorcycle gang in New York City. On Inside Story, tomorrow at 9 Eastern, 10 Pacific. Now, Law and Order is next on A&E.